All right. Um, well, first of all, uh, thanks to everybody that's that's tuning in and, and for the opportunity to, to present. Um, I'm going to be talking about uh, struct some structure function um, concepts that we've been seeing in um, liquid liquid phase separation and biomolecules. Um, but before I get started on that, I want to take one slide to sort of very quickly introduce a motif um, that isn't really going to surprise anybody in this audience, I don't think, but, uh, but it's going to be sort of a recurring theme uh, that pops up over and over again in the talk. So it's worth discussing briefly. So, um, you know, let's look at these two uh, biomolecules here. Um, and as a physicist, um, the first thing I'm going to ask myself is, is what are certain properties of these molecules here? So I'm going to look at things like the size of them. Um, they're both um, smallish uh, proteins, which means that they have a common uh, polypeptide backbone, um, similar molecular masses. Um, I'm going to look at things like the charge. And both of these are relatively weakly charged. Um, and then I'm going to, I might take a little bit closer of a look and say that, you know, hey, these are both have globular folds. And in fact, uh, topologically, the folds aren't all that different. They're, they're sort of this alpha combined alpha beta um, topology. And so based on these physical characteristics, I'm going to look at these molecules and say with a, a fair degree of confidence that anything I might say about one of these molecules is probably equally likely to be valid about the other. Um, now, the problem is, is that this conclusion is incredibly useless as far as biology goes, because biology doesn't care about these physical characteristics. Um, what biology cares about is function. And the function of these two molecules really couldn't be you know, that much different. So with that brief introduction out of the way, um, I'm gonna shift gears here and start talking about um, these liquid condensates um, that have been found throughout the cell. Um, now, many of these bodies, um, you know, have, or these structures have been known for, you know, decades or, or you, know, close, you know, since at least the dawn of, uh, of electron microscopy. Um, but there's a lot more of them uh, that are being discovered uh, more recently. Um, as people uh, look for them more carefully. And the common characteristics here is they tend to be liquid-like. Um, they tend to be driven by a spontaneous condensation of biomolecules. Um, and in fact, many of them have uh, characteristics of, of liquid, liquid phase separation. Now, liquid-liquid phase separation in biomolecules has been known for um, a long time, um, at least since the, the late 70s. Um, but the thing that makes these different uh, inside the cell is that they seem to be driven by these uh, polymer-like mo molecules. And what this uh, polymer-like characteristic um, looks like um, can be different. Um, in some cases, you have these sort of like beaded chains of, of folded domains. And in other cases, you have these uh, intrinsically disordered uh, polypeptide chains. Well, with that observation, um, this unlocks uh, um, the incredible power of, of polymer physics that, that's been developed um, over the, the decades. Um, and of course, you know, the starting point on this uh, for a lot of analysis is, is Flory Huggins theory. Um, now, of course, the, the, the problem with Flory Huggins theory is that it was developed to handle homopolymers, uh, things like polystyrene, and, and, and biomolecules are different um, in that they, um, have, are heterogeneous. Um, you have these discrete sticky moieties, um, which you know can either be you know these large globular uh, folded domains, or they can be you know sort of individual sticky amino acids along the backbone of the of the, the chain. Um, but but once you identify what the sticky parts are and what the inert parts are, um, then you've got you know theories that were you know developed you know back in the '90s. Uh, Semenov and Rubinstein is is, is um, a paper that, that, that comes up over and over again. Um, and these have been applied uh, for a variety of protein systems. And so, you know, coming at this from a very um, uh, physics uh, motivated uh, viewpoint, um, this is the framework that, that I, uh, I got into this, uh, this, these projects here expecting. Um, and what I'm gonna show you here is, is a couple of projects that we've worked on um, on a pair of uh, uh, protein systems here that have all the hallmarks of these sort of stickers and spacers type of modeling here. Um, and my expectation was is that we were gonna be able to capture these with a very common 
uh, physical framework here. Um, and it turns out that there's going to be a bit of a plot twist that comes along uh, later on. So let me introduce the two systems that we've studied. Um, these are both binary systems, uh, which means you have two molecules and you require both molecules in the system at the same time um, in order for them to phase separate. So each one of these systems has one molecule that is a chain of folded domains. Um, in this case here, that it's the folded protein is called SPOP and it polymerizes into these long rods that, that are essentially rigid on the length scales that we're interested in. Over here, um, the uh, folded domain is called SUMO, um, and this has been uh, linked together with these uh, short amino acid linkers. Um, the intrinsically disordered binding partners, in this case, are DAX, and over here, it's polysim, and sim is just the binding domain that, uh, that, that binds to SUMO. Um, now, now we start getting into the differences. And the difference is, um, it, you know, in this case, uh, SPOP polymerizes um, to lengths on the order of about 50 uh, folded domains, whereas DAX, um, what the modeling shows is that these pairs of binding sites here seem to act cooperatively. So this means that we have effectively two um, interaction sites here um, and giving us a valence of two. So a very asymmetric. Uh, valence over here. Um, the polysuma polysyn system, it's actually an engineered system. So everything is perfectly symmetric. And, uh, and so they both have a valence of, of 10 binding uh, modules here. Um, although all my cartoons only have four because um, I, I don't want to draw 10. Um, the spacers are also very asymmetric. Um, as I mentioned, these polymerize into essentially rigid rods. Um, so the spacers here are kind of non-existent, um, whereas the gap between these binding pairs is about 67 amino acids. And over here, again, it's an engineered system. The spacers are, are perfectly symmetric. It's just 12 flexible amino acids between the, the binding domains. So when we start looking at the phase diagram, um, let's look at spot DAX first. Um, some, some characteristics starts to pop up that, that are a little bit chin scratching. So uh, what are we looking at here? Well, okay, so this is my concentration of these SPOP rods. And so what you should think about is I've got these rods in solution, and I'm going to start to add this cross-linking glue to them. So not surprisingly, if I don't have any glue, I essentially get this non-interacting gas of the rods. As I add the cross-linker together, um, I get sort of a, a cross-linked gel-like network. And then as I continue to add more and more DAX, the, um, the gel dissolves and I start to get these liquid-like droplets. Everything rounds off and it, it becomes fluid-like. You get coalescence, um, all the characteristics that you expect of a liquid. So to my eye, this phase diagram looks funny because what we're looking at here is essentially a vapor, a solid, and a liquid which means that those liquid and the solid have sort of inverted positions over what you would naively expect. So we, we got to work on trying to model this, and uh, I'm not gonna show you all the stops and starts on, on the modeling, but I'm gonna show you here is the, is the theory that, that ended up working here. And so, um, oh, let's see, before I do that, I gotta mention one piece of information that's, that ends up being important. And that is that the cross-linking glue um, will actually phase separate at much, much higher concentrations. So about an order of magnitude higher than the, the highest concentration um, that's shown on this chart here, even, even a little bit further than that. Okay, so here's the model that worked. Um, let's, let's start with the obvious one here. Um, the gel-like, the cross-linked network here, um, not surprisingly, you've got these rigid rods, a SPOP, and DAX is these sort of bivalent black molecules that I've got drawn in here. Um, here's the, the Lego representation. This was my pandemic endeavor was to convert all my science to Lego form. Um, and so I think it's kind of helpful in some of these cases to see a couple of different representations. Um, in the vapor phase, uh, no surprises here. Um, you've got the, the bivalent molecules binding to the rods. Uh, the only difference here is that there's just not enough cross links to overcome the translational entropy cost of, of condensing this into a dense, uh, um, into the network. Now, the interesting one is this liquid phase. What's going on over here? And what's going on here 
is that at this point, you've got this huge stoichiometric excess of DAX here. So this is, you know, five DAX molecules to or, uh, 500 micromolar to 15 micromolar. And so what you've done is you've completely oversaturated the, the SPOP here. And so you can't form any crosslinks here. This molecule can't bind to the next SPOP rod because all the binding sites have already been occupied with other DAX molecules here. And so you don't get this, this strong cross-linking behavior. Instead, what you get is these weak interactions between the DAX. Remember, DAX will phase separate by itself. And so what we've essentially done is amplified those weak interactions by, by condensing them together. Um, and this is just equivalent to increasing the polymerization number on a polymer in Flory Huggins theory. So once we had a molecule, uh, we, we went and talked to the, the experimental group. This is Tani Matag's group at, at St. Jude. And, and what they did is they uh, went in and measured the affinity constants for both bivalent cross-linking and, and or bivalent binding and, and monovalent um, attachment here. And once we had those parameters, we could plug them into the theory um, and, and with very few things left over to adjust, the, the phase diagram pops right out. This is the, the theory of the model compared to the, uh, the experiments here with the symbols. Um, with no additional parameters, um, it does a pretty good job of explaining what's going on in the concentration of molecules inside the dense phase. And, and so the, the, the point is, is that we, we think we've got a pretty good understanding of what's going on in these, these condensed phases. So let me just summarize this, this story here very briefly. Um, we've got a gel phase that's driven by these strong cross-linking interactions. And we've got a liquid phase that's driven by these weaker interactions between these, these bristles that are hanging off the, the, the rod-like backbones. And we can control the transition between these two phases at equilibrium by tuning the stoichiometry of these two different molecules. Okay. So that's the first story. Let's move on to the second story here. The second story here um, is, as I mentioned, the two molecules here are sumo and sem. And, and I mentioned that this is a synthetic system. And so the experimental group, this is uh, Mike Rosen at uh, UT Southwestern, what they wanted to do is test this, uh, uh, explore this scaffold client framework that, that they were using to describe um, these condensates. And so the idea here, is that if I wanna make a functional condensate, well, the first thing I need to do is build a, sca a, a network scaffold here. And then what I can do is I can decorate this scaffold full of you know, functional molecules like enzymes, uh, essentially like a Christmas tree. And so they wanted to understand this, this physics of, of you know, how the scaffold molecules interact with the clients. So in their vision, um, you have these polysumo and these polysim uh, long chains here. They're, they're decavalent uh, in the experiments, only tetravalent in my cartoons. Um, and these are going to be your scaffolds. These are going to build this macroscopic network. And then they're going to send in fluorescent ver versions of the same molecule, the same binding domain, um, but at much lower valence, either monovalent or bivalent or, or even trivalent. Um, although I didn't draw that here because it starts to look like uh, my, my cartoon shortcuts. Okay, so, so again, this looks dramatically like uh, a sticker and spacer network here. And, and we had some, some good models to, to throw at, at these sorts of sticker and spacers. And so that's what we did. We said, okay, we've got this spot DAX cross-linking model here. Um, we've got Flory Huggins theory. Um, we looked at, at, at what had currently been worked out in the associative polymers uh, language. And, and we, we said, you know, is there anything here that, that, that looks like it's, it's describing um, these uh, sumo sim networks? Um, and the answer was an emphatic no. Um, and the reason for that is that no matter what theory we used, um, it was predicting essentially closed packed concentrations. Um, you know, typically these are lattice models and, and so, you know, we would predict lattice occupancies in excess of 90%. Um, you know, and so there's some conversion there between the lattice, you know, length scale and the, the real length scale. But, but no matter how you cut it, you're at least an order of magnitude off of this experimental volume fraction, which is measured to be about 2%. So after much, you know, hand wringing and, and, and heads pounding on tables, um, we were essentially forced to give up on this model of this randomly cross-linked uh, system. 
And this actually makes a lot of sense when you think about it. You know, so, so there's, you know, if you have a random network, you've got some mesh density, some cross-linking density here. And so that's gotta be set by some length scale in your, in your model here or in your system. And here, the only length scale that can set that cross-linking uh, density is this linker size here. And this is only 12 amino acids in this system. And so this is consistent with these very high uh, concentrations that, that we, were, we were getting out of the, the model. So we need a new length scale and something else to set this, this cross-linking density. And so again, after much hand-wringing and, and, and confusion, um, it eventually dawned on us that this is a, a terrible way to satisfy the binding interactions here. And a much more efficient way to satisfy your binding interactions is if you align your molecules up parallel with each other. So here's the model that comes out of that. So I've got my uh, one scaffold here, and I'm going to align the next scaffold parallel to it. There's you know, a free tail there. And so I can assemble these things into sort of like a one-dimensional filament. Now, this is a thermal system, of course. Um, and so this is a very disordered assembly process, and we're going to get some defects. Now, one type of defect is going to be the sticky ends. These are the things that allow these, uh, these scaffolds in order to polymerize into the, the longer filament. But you're also going to have these gaps that emerge in between. And what we have now is a new length scale that's emerging from the problem. That is the spacing between the gaps. And so the claim is, is what we're actually seeing here is a cross-linked network between the gaps. Okay, so here are the, between these defects. Okay, so I've got two defects here and they're gonna form a cross-link there. Two defects here, they form a cross-link there. And so what we have here is we've got these big inert regions where all the binding is satisfied. And what this has done is it's greatly fluffed up the network here um, due to this new length scale between the defects. And so again, here's the Lego version where we assemble this filament and it's got some defects in between. And then we're uh, subsequently going to assemble these, these filaments into a three-dimensional network there. Okay, so what we need to do um, is now to calculate the density of these defects. And that's kind of fortunate because this ends up being exactly what the experiments were probing when they send in these monovalent fluorescently probed clients. Um, and so they're detecting this defect density. And so we can use this to, to check um, that this model is, is, is accurately capturing the system. So here's what the experiments look like. What they're doing here is they're changing the concentration of the two scaffold species here. So this is you know, my blue scaffold access, here's my yellow scaffold access. And then they're probing it with the fluorescently tagged yellow monomer here. Um, and so not surprisingly, if I've got an excess of blue scaffold, I get a lot more of the fluorescence of this molecule, a lot more of it being recruited into the, into the dense phase here. Now, the puzzling thing is when you look at this quantitatively, okay? And if I go along this bottom axis here, what you see is a non-monotonic behavior. Fluorescence is going up here, and then it's not really easy to tell with your, your naked eye, but it, the fluorescence starts to go down over here. And this was really puzzling to us, it was puzzling to Mike, um, but we were so frustrated with this density um, conundrum that, uh, that we just sort of shoved it aside and said, okay, we'll, we'll deal with that later. We, we don't know what's going on. And it was to our great surprise that, that actually the explanation for this came out of this filamentous theory. So let me explain what's going on. It's, it's, it's fairly straightforward here. Here I've got my one dimensional filament. I'm probing with the yellow client here. And of course, I've got some defects down here that the yellow client can bind to. If I add more blue scaffold to the solution, well, there's only one place it can bind to, and that's at, the, at this you know, free tail here, this yellow tail over here. And of course, this gives me a lot more blue binding sites, so I'm gonna recruit more client and the fluorescence goes up, no surprises. Now, the problem is, is that if I continue to put more blue scaffold into the system, there's no more yellow tails for it to bind to. And so what that means is that the blue scaffold starts to accumulate in free solution. And what that does is the free solution scaffolds compete for the clients and pull it back out of, the, out of the dense phase. And this leads to the fluorescence dropping back down. 
Now, this is going to happen in any network to some degree, but the argument is that it's going to be more sensitive in this one, sort of pseudo one dimensional system because it's going to be a lot less tolerant to stoichiometric mismatches than, say, a random network could be. Now, the filamentous network has some other characteristics that are interesting too, in that it introduces correlations in where your free binding sites are. So if I come in and I, I, I probe it, you know, the monomer client doesn't care about correlations. A binding site is a binding site, it doesn't care. But this guy here clearly cares that there's two open binding sites next to each other because, you know, and, and this is gonna be more likely in this type of system than it would be um, in a random network. So here we're comparing calculations of the theory to the, to the experiments here, which are the, the, error, the points of the error bars here. And I'm comparing mono, or trivalent, bivalent, and monovalent clients. Now, not surprisingly, these guys are, they have a higher affinity and this leads to the higher peak in the recruitment here. Um, but what I wanna draw your attention to is that the location of the peak is changing. It's 60 here, about 65 here, and it's about 75 down here. You'll see that in, in just a second here. Now, if we change the affinity of the clients, you can change the height of the peak without doing much to changing the location of the peak. And so what this, this structure in the network is doing here is it's giving us two different knobs that we can use to adjust either the height of these peaks or the location of the peak. And so if I say, we, we said, what, what would happen if we, if we took a, a trivalent client and a monovalent client and tuned them so that they had affinities that had um, equal height peaks? And so this is what you have. You have a liquid network here that can specifically select between either recruiting the trivalent client and dumping the monovalent client or recruiting the monovalent client and dumping the trivalent client. So this is essentially a liquid with site-specific recognition and the ability to recruit and reject clients. Okay, so I'm getting a little short on time here, but the summary for the sumo sim uh, story here is that we have this one-dimensional network here that one reduces the density of the network and it gives us this ability to recognize and recruit clients. Okay, so, the real interesting thing happens when you compare these two stories here, okay? So in, we went into this with this expectation that we were looking for this sort of universal sticker and spacer type of, of network here. And instead, what we found is that in each case, we needed to impose a specific network topology to explain what was going on. In this case, we sort of have these cylindrical brush-like structures that control the ability to toggle between a liquid phase and a gel phase. And over here, we have this you know, these one-dimensional filaments that allow us the sensitivity to select which clients we either bind or reject. And so basically what happened is we went into this looking for physics-like universality, and instead what we discovered was biological structure function. So now before I have to go to my department head and say, hey, I need to resign my position in the physics department, I'm gonna take the next step here and ask, are there principles underlying the encoding of function within these liquid states? I'm gonna argue that there are. So here's our canonical biological example of structure function. Okay, it's an enzyme, it's got some structure that, that encodes specificity and catalytic activity. Now, in order for this structure to be relevant, it's got to be stable with respect to thermal fluctuations. And so this mandates the energy scale for globular protein stability, which is on the order of about 10 kT. Now, I if I take interactions of this uh, order and I use it to build a three-dimensional structure, like a condensate, the result I get is a rock. Okay. This is gonna be completely inert. It is not gonna have any dynamics at all. I'm gonna arrest all diffusion. Um, this is, does not have the sort of liability that I expect for something that is alive. Okay, so I've overdone things, okay? Let's dial down the affinity. Let's allow these bonds to start to form and break and let's restore some dynamics to the system. Okay, now I've got goo. Okay, I've got some sort of amorphous goo. And so I have dynamics, but I don't have the 
ability to encode any kind of specific structure to it that I would need for a specific function. And so the point is that there's this incompatibility here between the strength of the interactions that I need to encode uh, function and the dynamics that I need for something to be alive. Well, I just gave you two examples of, of how systems can maintain liquid-like behavior, dynamics, and yet encode specific structure. Well, how do they do that? Well, what they do is they mix these strong and weak interactions together. Okay, so in this case here, we've got a set of strong interactions that encodes the cylindrical brush-like structure. Over here, we've got these cooperative binding between the modules that lead to this one-dimensional filamentous behavior. Then what I want to do is I want to build this structure up hierarchically in a way that allows it to maintain dynamics. And so what I'm going to do is I'm going to have these weaker interactions that allow this to assemble into a higher order structure. And so we think that this is sort of a generic model for what's going in these biological condensates, is that you're going to have sort of some sort of functional assembly driven by interactions that are strong enough to encode some sort of uh, specific structure and then weaker interactions to drive them together into a condensed state. And so we've seen this anywhere some sort of structural characteristics have been identified in these condensates, you seem to have this hierarchy of strong and weak interactions together. So with that, I'll put up my acknowledgement slide. I'd be happy to take any questions. Uh, my group is, is recruiting at both the PhD and the postdoc level. So um, anybody that's got any uh, young theorists looking for a uh, postdoc, I'd, I'd love to, to look at um, any CVs that came from this audience and uh, um, look forward to hearing your questions. Um, great. Uh, thank you, Jeremy. Uh, we have um, we have one question from Gianwa. <laughs> um, and um, he says, do you see slow relaxation dynamics for the uh, SUMO system? Uh, that is, at first the system may be trapped in some local free energy minima, then the slow exchange between binding and free molecules uh, lead to further relaxation to lower free energy. Yeah, the, the, the short answer to, to, to that is that um, I haven't done the, I, my group didn't do the experiments. So, uh, you know, I, I don't know. I mean, the, the best, what I've seen is, is basically what I showed in this talk here, which is these, these images showing um, you know, the, the largely spherical structures um, and the ability to coalesce and, and, and these kinds of things. And um, I think that paper might have had frat dynamics too, but, uh, but you know, so there is some time scale there, but, but I, I don't actually have enough experience with the system personally to know what it is. Great. Um, we don't have more talks, uh, but, uh, oh, right. One from Ashish. Uh, Bihani, can we predict which proteins would form the scaffold and which ones the client based on their sequence and biophysical properties? Yeah, there's a lot of work going on um, doing that in, in, in the field. Um, my group's not doing any of it, um, but there's there's a lot of um, a lot of effort trying to to figure out what what the sequence signatures are, um, uh, you know, of, of clients versus versus scaffolds and. Um, I could scratch my brain and, and, and give you some references if in the, after the talks, if, if you were interested in that. Great, great. Um, so we are, um, um, we need to move on to the next talk, but uh, everybody, the speakers will